means a lot. Feel free to have some pizza. And I really want to let uh, Mr. Mountcastle do most of the talking. But, you know, this event is called Billionaire Justice Insights from Lead Prosecutor Rick Mountcastle on the Purdue Pharma case and understanding its lasting impacts on the opioid crisis. So hopefully, or maybe you already know, he helped lead, Mr. Mountcastle helped lead the federal response to the Purdue Pharma case, which is, well, again, I don't want to share too much, but led by the Sackler family. And they not only should have known the harm that they were doing, but were well aware of the harm that they were perpetuating. And also Mr. Mountcastle led the federal response to the Unite the Right rally about taking down a statue of a Confederate soldier. I think it was a Stonewall in Charlottesville, Virginia, which is where I'm from. So that was also a particular interest, but we decided that that would be too much time. We're going to focus on this. And I think it's a great story because, you know, it feels like all the odds are stacked against you and you want to give up and you just keep going. And so I hope he has a lot of insight and helps inspire us all. So take it away. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, so good afternoon, Vermont Law. How are you all doing? <laughs> thank you for allowing me the honor of speaking to you for a few minutes this afternoon. It's I know it's a Friday afternoon and a, probably a beautiful fall day there as it is here. This has been a very unusual year for me. In June, I retired after 42 years of government service, uh, 35 of those spent as a federal and state prosecutor. Also in June, after 30 year, uh, 38 years of living in Virginia, I moved to South Carolina. And then to top it off up to this point, six weeks ago, I attended the primetime Emmy Awards ceremony in Los Angeles courtesy of the producer, director, writer, and showrunner of the Hulu miniseries, Dope Sick, which had received 14 nominations. And of course, I did not foresee any of these things. I had no thought about any of those things when I was, like you, in law school many, many years ago. In fact, when I started law school, I had no thought about becoming any kind of a prosecutor and I wasn't really sure what kind of law I wanted to practice. And by the time I graduated, I had this thought that I wanted to practice in an area that involved public service uh, or the public interest. And of course, I had no idea of what that really looked like. Uh, at one point, I had a vague thought that I would do something in environmental law and fight big corporations that were trying to pollute the earth. And so in my second and third years, I clerked part time during school and full time during the summer with the Environmental Protection Agency. I, I was going to law school in, in Washington, D.C. at George Washington University. But also during my second year, I became involved in the law school's community legal clinic, which was a clinic that served low income residents of Washington, D.C. who needed representation in various legal matters such as social security disability hearings, landlord tenant proceedings, small claims court and the like. And I really, really liked it. And so I did that again my third year as well. So my first message to you today is use your time in law school to try different things, particularly things that uh, are outside the classroom. So speaking of the classroom, uh, so in law school, I didn't really like criminal procedure. And I didn't really care for criminal law, and I hated the income tax law course I took. So by the time I graduated, I decided that I would never practice criminal law and I would never practice tax law. And I learned a lesson about that statement a few years later. Also, during my third year, we had I guess you still do this. We had you know, sort of the third year job interview scramble. Uh, probably looks different now than it did then, but it was kind of a, a very stressful time uh, as law school was coming to a close and uh, people were wanting to find positions uh, to, 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 to work in. And for me, that period of time, there was good news and bad news. The good news was I didn't have to do the third year 
um, job interview scramble. The bad news was that the reason I didn't have to do that was because I owed the Army four years due to a ROTC scholarship that paid for my undergraduate degree. So after graduation, I did a four-year tour of duty in the Army as an Army JAG captain. And I was assigned to the Army's recruiting command, which at the time was located in Illinois. And my job there was to serve as the legal advisor to the com uh, recruiting command senior leadership, basically two generals and lots of colonels. So in essence, my first job out of law school was the functional equivalent of a corporate counsel, not exactly the public interest career path that I had envisioned. Nevertheless, I did my best. I sought to provide excellent, excellent legal advice and learn from my supervisors and from the experienced lawyers that I work with. So after two years as a legal advisor at the headquarters, the Army transferred me to a regional office located at the same base, and I became the sole attorney advisor to a regional commander. So it was basically a one-man law office or one-person law office. And during my first year in that position, my boss and my main client was a, an armor colonel, armor being you know, guy in charge of tanks, and he, and he disliked lawyers. So that was when the most memorable event of my time in the Army happened. And that would be the day my boss, this colonel, kicked me out of his office. So he was what they call a hard charger, a commander who would do whatever it takes, including sacrificing his subordinates, of course, to accomplish the mission. So he was a difficult client, to say the least. And at one point, he decided to order all of his subordinates in the region, which covered the several states in the Midwest, to wear more formal uniforms than they were required to by regulation and by headquarters policy. And one of his subordinates, subordinates didn't like that, and they pushed back uh, and filed an appeal or a complaint that was allowed by regulation. And the regulation also required the commander against whom the complaint was made to provide a copy to his superiors, those would be the generals and other colonels at headquarters. My boss decided that he would handle it himself and he refused to comply with a requirement uh, that, that the regulation called for that a copy be sent to his superiors. So it came upon me one day, I was tasked with going into his office to tell him that he needed to follow the regulations and send the complaint up. So talk about having to do something that you really don't want to do. But as lawyers, we're called upon to do justice, to do the ethical things, to do the hard things, to do unpleasant things, to do uncomfortable things, to do things that we don't necessarily want to do all the time. So I went into his office and told him that as his lawyer, I was advising him that he had a legal requirement by regulation to transmit that complaint to headquarters. So then I got to watch him turn red. I got to watch him yell at me. And then I got to watch him tell me to get out of his office. So I left. But the, guess what? The complaint was sent up. As a lawyer, and this is, this is another lesson that I learned fairly early in my career, as a lawyer, be prepared to face difficult decisions and perform hard, unpleasant, and uncomfortable tasks that justice, ethics, and the rules of professional conduct require. So when my four-year tour in the Army was over, I ended up taking a position as a legal advisor at the Federal Railroad Administration, a sub-agency of the Department of Transportation, and I represented the agency in personnel and labor matters. Again, corporate counsel, not the public interest work that I had envisioned when I was in law school. But in that position, I got to travel to Alaska three times. At the time, the federal government still owned the Alaska Railroad, and I was assigned to represent the agency in an administrative hearing involving a personnel action against a railroad employee. 
that experience led me to decide that I needed to get some trial experience. So I signed up for a program where lawyers for government agencies uh, in D.C. could be detailed to work in the misdemeanor trial section at the District of Columbia U.S. Attorney's Office as special assistant United States attorneys. Now, even though I had decided five years earlier that I would never do criminal law, hey, this was just to get trial experience, right? So I had some, something like 11 jury trials and at least a dozen bench trials during a four-month period of the program, and I really liked it. So the lesson from that experience was find opportunities to develop your legal skills af even after law school. That experience prompted me to decide six years later, after I had vowed never to do criminal law as well as tax law, to become a prosecutor. And I accepted a job at the Department of Justice. And of course, the job was in the criminal section of the tax division. It's the lesson from that. Keep an open mind or <laughs> never say never. So even though my jobs up to this point did not fit this vision I had of my career path, I gave each and every job and a task within those jobs my full time and attention and put the effort in to provide my clients with excellent representation. So that's another takeaway. Give every task that you are given as a lawyer, no matter how unpleasant or mundane your best effort and provide excellent legal representation. So as a trial attorney at the Department of Justice, I traveled around the country prosecuting criminal tax cases in federal court. Uh, went to places that included South Carolina, Key West and Miami, Florida, Birmingham, Alabama, Knoxville, Tennessee, Charlotte, North Carolina, Roanoke and Abingdon, Virginia. Spent about 60% of my time traveling, worked long hours. A number of my law school professors had said that for every hour you spend in court, you're required to spend four hours preparing for that hour. And I found that to be literally true and probably maybe even a low estimate of the time that I needed to prepare for court. In 1992, I was awarded the Attorney General's John Marshall Award for the Trial of Litigation, which is one of the highest awards of the department, for prosecuting a Russian organized crime leader for a gasoline tax fraud scheme in the Eastern District of New York. And eight and a half years and 12 jury trials later, I transferred to the admin and branch office of the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Western District of Virginia. And that brings us to the Purdue Pharma case. And if we go to the slide uh, show, if, if you put up slide, the second slide, that, which is a map of Virginia, if you look at th that map um, and go down to the bottom left corner, there's a section in blue that's the third county over from the Tennessee and Kentucky. Abingdon, Virginia is located way down there in that far southwestern corner, that left bottom part um, of the state on this map. And it probably has some similarities to where you all are in Royalton, Vermont. Uh, Abingdon's population was less than 8,000. It's a small rural town in southern Appalachia. When I moved there in 1995, a significant segment of its industrial base was leaving the area. Textile and furniture manufacturers were closing their factories and leaving due to NAFTA. And that was gonna leave coal mining and farming as the two main employers. And historically, a significant number of the residents were disabled due to injuries sustained in coal mining and other hard labor. And the predominant drugs of abuse were diverted prescription opioids, as opposed to street drugs like cocaine and heroin that you would find in more urban areas. So our, we had a little office, and if we go to the next slide, uh, there's a building there. It's a, kind of a strip mall that's right across the railroad tracks from the federal courthouse. And our office is that first door on the left in the foreground. So we, did, we had a, like basically one third of that, uh, that floor in the, in the strip mall. 
Uh, and because the office was so small, it was staffed by three attorneys and three support staff, uh, I ended up prosecuting a wide variety of cases, such as illegal firearms, narcotics, healthcare fraud, et cetera, during my first five or six years there. So the next slide, we have the case caption. This was the, how the, the, the case ended up looking and involved the investigation and prosecution of Purdue Pharma LP, a limited par partnership, a pharmaceutical business owned and operated since 1952 by three generations of the Sackler family. And yes, this was the Sackler family that had, had wings in, in uh, many of the museums, um, I guess the museum, you know, I don't know all the museums, but they had a wing. They have, they may still have a wing in the Smithsonian, uh, and in some of the museums in New York and across uh, across the world. Actually, uh, the products of the company included Betadine, Senecot, and and up to that time, uh, something called MS Cotton, a delayed release morphine prescribed almost exclusively for severe pain related to cancer. And by the early 1990s, when MS Cotton's past patent exclu uh, exclusivity was about to expire, Purdue began looking to develop a, rep a replacement product, and it came up with OxyContin. So on the next slide, we see the product, OxyContin, like morphine, is a delayed release opioid. In essence, Purdue took the MS Cotton delayed release delivery system and replace the morphine with oxycodone, which is a synthetic form of um, uh, an opioid. Um, and uh, the main, we'll see, as we'll see, the main difference between OxyContin and other opioids, single dose opioids like Percocet um, or roxycodone, is the higher concentration of opioid in a single pill. And they made pills anywhere from 10 to 80 milligrams. And at one point, they had a 160 milligram pill. And up to that point in time, your single dose opioids were only five, seven and a half, or 10 milligrams. So in 1995, not long after I arrived in Abingdon, Purdue applied to the FDA for approval to manufacture and market OxyContin. So slide, this slide here shows the beginning of the investigation. So during the late 1990s, our little branch office in Abingdon tried to address the prescription drug diversion problem in a number of ways. And of course, we began by prosecuting low-level dealers selling prescription opioids on the street. And we learned that a patient could go to a local physician, complain about being in pain, usually some sort of back pain, receive a prescription for a 30-day supply of pain pills, fill it at a local pharmacy for $1 copay if they had Medicaid, and sell the pain pills to a street dealer who would then sell pills to people who back then we called them addicts and abusers. Uh, I think that that is not the way to address folks that are addicted uh, current anymore any longer. So our office prosecuted a number of street dealers. And of course, those prosecutions did little, if anything, to stop the trafficking of diverted pain pills. So we then uh, concluded that the only way that pain pills were making it to the illegal street market was that doctors were giving prescriptions to patients who didn't really need them. And we could be more effective by investigating and prosecuting doctors who were writing opioid prescriptions without legitimate medical purpose or outside the bounds of medical practice. So during the period of 1997 through 2000, we pr prosecuted several doctors for the illegal prescribing of opioids. While we were doing those cases, we noticed a trend. Doctors were transitioning from prescribing the single dose opioids like the Percocets, Lortabs, Vicodins, Dilaudids, et cetera, to OxyContin a new drug that contained these larger amounts of oxycodone in a single tablet. And during that same time period, we began receiving reports from local law enforcement that there was a huge spike in property crimes driven by the street demand for diverted OxyContin. And we learned that OxyContin was selling on the street for $1 per milligram. So a Medicaid patient could get a month's worth of OxyContin, 60 pills for $1, 
but those pills had a street value of anywhere from $600 to $4,800, depending on the strength of the pills. And then finally, we began receiving reports from local pharmacists that Purdue Pharma sales reps were pressuring them to fill OxyContin prescriptions, even when they questioned the legitimacy of the prescriptions. So I remember one afternoon in the early spring of 2001, my colleague, Randy Ramsire, who's also depicted in the Hulu miniseries, and I were talking about these things, and we decided we ought to open up an investigation of Purdue. Now, we'd never done a case like this before, and our office had limited, a limited number of attorneys, a limited number of support staff, and limited resources. And moreover, the investigative resources in the area were also limited. There were three FBI agents for the whole area in, in Bristol, which is about 10 miles from Abbey, and then a couple of DEA agents were around. But the nearest other investigators like Health and Human Services and FDA were hours away. The FBI declined to participate when we asked them. And the DEA said they would participate, but they would send a couple of agents down from Washington every so often, which was basically worthless. Um, so we ended up ha on the federal investigator of the federal investigators having one health and human services investigator uh, part time from two hours away and two FDA investigators part time from six hours away. Despite this lack of resources, my feeling was this was a huge problem in our community. Uh, people were, get, were overdosing. Uh, there was lots of addiction going on. There was lots of crime being driven by that. And we had an obligation to our community to find out why this was going on and whether there was somebody above the doctors that was responsible for it. Now, as a result of my work as a criminal tax prosecutor, I had contacts within the IRS and I was able to obtain an IRS agent to investigate the financial aspects of the case. And a couple of years prior to that, I had also prosecuted a case that involved uh, fraud against the uh, Virginia's bingo enforcement agency. So it was a bingo, basically a bingo fraud case. Uh, and in that case, I had worked with an IRS agent and a state investigator named Randy Klaus. So one of Klaus' roles in that case was to go into bingo games undercover as a bingo player uh, to observe who ran and controlled the games. Now, Randy Klaus is about six foot, four inches tall, weighs about 350 pounds. And I always pictured this very large man inside a smoke-filled bingo hall with the stereotypical group of old ladies playing bingo and I always try to figure out how did that work? <laughs> but it, apparently it worked. Um, but Klaus had be, gone on to become the head of the Attorney General's fledgling Medicaid fraud control unit. And, and they had a small Abingdon office. So I asked him to provide agents and other resources. And he did so without hesitation. He provided us with two investigators to work full time on this massive case that we were about to embark on. In addition to that, we didn't have any room in the U.S. Attorney's Office to provide workspace for this investigation. So I asked the FDA for help, and they agreed to rent us space in an office building about a mile from the U.S. Attorney's Office. And that goes to the next slide is a, is a picture of, the, of that office building. And we had a that was a, a large building with lawyers and medical offices in it. We had a, an office in there uh, uh, about a mile from the strip mall office where the U.S. Attorney's Office was located. I also knew from my experience prosecuting tax and health care fraud cases that we would obtain a large amount of documents and that it was crucial to properly manage those documents. So I asked the FDA if they would provide someone to perform that function, to be a document manager. And they told me that they could fund a contract if I could find someone 
in Abingdon to manage a large amount of documents in what was going to be a massive, very technical case. So I turned to Stephanie, my wife, and asked her if she knew anyone in the small town of Abingdon who might be a good person to manage a large volume of documents. Well, it just so happened that she'd been talking to our pediatrician, Dr. Johnson, Helen Johnston, and I'm sure they must have been talking about their respective spouses. Uh, and she suggested that Helen's husband, John Johnston, might be someone to consider for that. Now, John was an Army reservist who also worked from home doing the books for Helen's medical practice, so he had that availability. But what sealed the deal was what, when Stephanie told me something she learned from Helen, John liked to collect T-shirts from different colleges from around the country. But his rule was that he had to physically go on campus and buy the shirt from the college bookstore. And on top of that, he kept them all in hangers in his closet, and they had to be in alphabetical order in his closet. So I decided right then and there that this was the kind of meticulousness and attention to detail that we needed to manage the documents in this case. And so John was the guy that we got uh, to fill that role. And the next slide will show you why that was important. So this is this slide and the, and the one after it, sh it uh, show just a portion of the records that John managed. I uh, don't know exactly how many, but it was more than 2,000 bankers boxes on top of that. Hundreds of uh, compact disks worth of electronic documents. And so John kept track um, of all these records, where they, when they came in, where they came from, what they were supposed to, you know, what the inventory of them was, uh, what they were to be. And his records were, his, his tracking was so good that if I needed to find something, I could describe generally what it was, kind of where it came from, and he could find it within 30 minutes. Of course, in addition to managing the records, we need a plan. We needed a plan to systematically review them. And so we had them scanned into a database, assigned our small band of agents and attorneys different search terms. So, for example, if we had a witness interview schedule, the preparation would include searching for documents related to that witness. Uh, same thing if we had a topic that we were focusing on, we'd search for any documents related to that topic. So as you can see, the case was massive with a huge volume of documents, hundreds of potential witnesses, and very complex matters involving medical journals, clinical studies, and the FDA's technical rules and guidance for pharmaceutical products. So in late 2004, I reached the conclusion that the only way to complete the investigation in a timely manner, with the diligence required, was for me to go to work on it full time. So in January of 2005, I moved out of my office at the strip mall and into the office space where these boxes were. And if we go back to the previous slide, the office that I used was in through that doorway in the upper right hand corner there. Uh, so for the next almost two years, that's where I worked. Now, if we go to the next slide, the FDA is required by law to review and approve every new prescription drug to ensure that it is safe and effective uh, for the public. And the FDA must also review and approve what's, what's called the package insert, which is the papers that come along with a prescription that describe, um, provide information about the drug, including directions for use um, and any kind of side effects, what the dosing is, that kind of thing. Thus, the FDA is charged with looking out for the public interest to keep the public safe from ineffective or unsafe drugs and to make sure that accurate information about drugs is provided to the public. So in 1995, the FDA assigned one of its medical reviewers, uh, a, Curtis, a fellow named Curtis Wright, who had a background in the clinical treatment of drug abuse and addiction, to review OxyContin. 
And as you see from this slide we're looking at right now, Wright's reviews concluded that for efficacy and safety, OxyContin was similar to and equal to single dose opioids on the market, and its only advantage was twice a day dosing. But after writing these reviews of the data, White also reviewed the package insert, and his findings are contained in the next slide on that. And, you know, while, um, so the package insert, as I mentioned, explains the drug's approved uses, its dosing, its benefits, and its risks to providers and patients. And surprisingly, White approved the following language in the package insert, which I came to memorize and still know even 15 years later. Delayed absorption as provided by OxyContin tablets is believed to reduce the abuse liability of a drug. Well, what does this mean? It's like complete nonsense, isn't it? I mean, who believed it? Certainly not Curtis Wright per his safety and efficacy re uh, reviews and not Wright's co-worker at the FDA who wrote him an email questioning whether this was marketing BS. Wright's reply to that email was, actually, Diane, this is literally true. Well, yes, it would be literally true. Even one Purdue marketing executive believed it, but the documentation in the FDA's file clearly shows that the FDA did not believe it. And the importance of Wright's approval of the package insert language can be measured by the fact in, that in October of 1998, Purdue hired him. Now, you might ask, isn't this a conflict of interest? Can they do that? And the answer to both questions I would submit is yes. And I spent a considerable amount of time investigating this corruption, which is what it is, because there had to be a crime, right? The only reasonable explanation was that Curtis Wright exchanged his approval of this language for the promise of a lucrative job at Purdue. But I could not find enough evidence to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt for purposes of a criminal case. And maybe even more surprising, there is nothing illegal about an FDA employee seeking and obtaining employment with the very companies that he or she is charged with regulating. Now, why was this one line in a multi-page package insert so important? Because isn't it as obvious to the doctors that are prescribing the drug as it is to us that this sentence, delayed absorption, as provided by OxyContin tablets, is believed to reduce the abuse liability of a drug, that that's complete nonsense? The problem was that Purdue used it to legitimize its false marketing claims, and some of those are shown in the next slide or summarized in the next slide. The bottom line is that Purdue said that OxyContin was not addictive. They had some language in there that less than 1% uh, who use it as prescribed get, addic uh, get addicted to it, uh, which again, you know, as, as is depicted in the miniseries, was based on some bogus uh, information. They marketed it as, as a drug that could not be abused because the delivery system could not be bypassed. Well, they knew it could be by simply scraping the outer coating off the pill you get by the delivery system, and then it can be crushed up and injected or snorted just like any other drug, um, street drugs that are opioids that are abused. They claimed it did not produce euphoria. They claimed it did not cause withdrawal when discontinued, among other lies. All of these claims are contrary to what everyone, especially physicians, knew about opioids in general. But the response to skeptical doctors in their marketing pitch, in Purdue's marketing pitch, was, well, the FDA agrees with these claims because they approved this package insert, which says that because of the delayed absorption system, OxyContin is less addictive and less abusable than other opioids. So they had, they could point to what they viewed as the FDA's endorsement in the, in the FDA approved package insert. And then they also lied about clinical data and mischaracterized results of clinical studies to support these claims. So the next slide is an example of this. Um, 
So this slide shows how they uh, misleadingly represented the opioid blood level data from the clinical studies. So the top graph that they would show to doctors purports to show the level of opioids in the blood of a patient using a single dose opioid during a 24 hour period. And this falsely depicts these, uh, these swings from the euphoria level at the top to the withdrawal level at the bottom uh, at, as, as a patient takes each and every dose. And this results in addiction, so the pitch goes. And the bottom graph that they use purports to show the opioid level in the blood of an OxyContin patient. And supposedly they're never in the euphoria range and never in the withdrawal range. Therefore, they never can never become addicted. Well, the next slide shows the actual graphs of the comparison data. The uh, bold portion or the bold line uh, on the graph, on the graph, I'm sorry, depicts the um, the blood level of an oxy of an oxycontin patient, and the lighter line depicts the blood level of an immediate release opioid patient. And as you can see, the peaks and the and the low points are roughly equal. And there's only a slightly lower level uh, drop in the blood level at the midpoint for a, an immediate release opioid patient. Slide 15 is an example of the false and misleading use of a clinical study article that they used to promote OxyContin to physicians. And this was an article dealing with the treatment of pain from osteoarthritis. So note that these two types of clinical studies are usually funded by the drug companies who are involved in the writing and publication of the studies. And these types of articles are often used to support the marketing of drugs. In this case, Purdue cherry picked the, the article language and the data that purported to its marketing, that supported its marketing claim that patients did not go through withdrawal when OxyContin was abruptly discontinued. So therefore, no addiction. And they concealed language and data that showed that patients actually did have withdrawal symptoms and that a number had, quote, adverse events, close quote, that were typical of a patient going through opioid withdrawal. So with the corrupted language and the package insert approved by Curtis Wright and the false and misleading use of clinical study data, the marketing pitch would go something like this. So doctor, are you going to put your patient at risk of addiction? and abuse by continuing to prescribe fill in the blank, Percocet, Lortab, Dilaudid, Morphine, et cetera? Or are you going to minimize, if not eliminate, the risk of addiction and abuse by prescribing Oxy, OxyContin? And so there you have the beginnings of the opioid crisis. So what we were up against, I firmly believe that most people thought that we would fail in our investigation. Uh, that, that would include the investigative agencies, our colleagues within the Department of Justice, uh, colleagues within the U.S. Attorney's Office, and of course the attorneys representing Purdue and its executives. Why, did, why would they think we would fail? Our office was small, it was under resources, resourced, and we had no track record of doing these kinds of cases. The two main investigative agencies had little or no participation, FBI and DEA, and other federal agencies provide only part-time or token support. So how did we adapt? So in the vast majority of criminal cases, the investigation is done by the law enforcement investigators. And then it, once they've completed their investigation, they're presented to the U.S. Attorney's Office or the Prosecuting Office. And that works fine. That, that methodology works fine for simple cases, but for complex fraud cases, my practice was to work directly with the investigators during the investigation. So I review documents, I learn the technical aspects of the case, like how the FDA conducts its new drug reviews, how it regulates advertising and the like. And I participated in key interviews. I would never give an investigator a task that I wasn't willing to do myself. And I wanted to be the team member that knew the most about the case. So in that way, I was in a position to direct the investigation and to make sure that our limited resources 
were used in the most efficient way possible. So the Hulu miniseries, if you've seen it, is accurate when it shows that I traveled to these different locations like North Carolina to interview witnesses that were in this video called I Got My Life Back, traveled to New York to interview witnesses at the advertising agency. Uh, I even went to Florida to, to interview the headhunter who was supposedly used by Purdue to hire Curtis Wright. Uh, but I never went on any of these interviews with another lawyer. That's that's one of the sort of uh, dramatic inaccuracies in the in the film. So Randy and I would never interview people together. Uh, I was always with another investigator. Why? Well, so I wouldn't be a witness. The investigator would always be the witness. I personally reviewed hundreds of thousands of pages of documents. And yes, I worked seven days a week for nearly two years, including going to work at five o'clock in the morning on Saturday and Sunday. All of that allowed me to give my boss and the investigative supervisors regular briefings on the progress of the case and to eventually convince them that we actually had a case. And it also enabled me to write the 120 page prosecution memorandum um, and recommendation in a way that it could withstand scrutiny by the Department of Justice supervisors who were looking for an excuse to decline the case. So slide 16, the case and the outcome. So in 2006, we began wrapping up the investigation. Like I said, I drafted this large prosecution memorandum for my boss, the U.S. attorney, and which I knew would be reviewed by senior, senior leadership at the Department of Justice. And we recommended that the company and the top three operational executives, Chief Executive Officer Michael Friedman, General Counsel Howard Udell, and Chief Medical Officer Paul Goldenheim, that they all be prosecuted for serious felony fraud charges. Purdue hired Howard Shapiro, former FBI general counsel from the Wilmer Hale Law Firm, a very high-powered criminal defense firm in D.C. Mary Jo White was the former U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York from the New York firm of Debevoise and Plimpton, was hired to represent Howard Udell. More recently, she's represented the Sackler family. I think she had a period where she served as the head of the Securities and Exchange Commission as well, so she's very well connected. Mark Pomerantz, the former appellate and criminal chief at the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York, um, was hired to represent uh, Michael Friedman. Uh, he was from the New York firm of Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Morton, and Garrison. And of course, they hired Rudolph Giuliani to sort of be the, the uh, political mover and shaker and to negotiate some sort of a, a resolution. At the time, in late 2006, Giuliani was a leading candidate for the Republican nomination for the 2008 presidential election. He was hired because he had a lot of influence over the political appointees at the Department of Justice. Our goal had always been to hold accountable the individuals at the highest decision-making level in the company who the evidence proved beyond a reasonable doubt were responsible for the criminal conduct. To us, the only way you change corporate behavior is to per prosecute the individuals who are making a corporation do illegal things. You know, the, the government has a long history of prosecuting companies and getting large settlements or what looked like on paper to be large settlements. And that just happens over and over again and it becomes the cost of doing business for those companies. So our thinking was that to change that behavior, you have to go after the individuals who are approving, facilitating, and making those decisions. We reasonably believe that if faced with serious felonies, one of those three top executives would flip and cooperate against the owners, the Sackler family, who we believe were responsible for making the final decisions. And it's my opinion that Giuliani influenced the senior leaders at DOJ to prevent us from prosecuting the uh, individual uh, executives for serious fel felonies. So the next slide, the DOJ resolution. 
um, as a result of the, this, um, of Giuliani's influence, and the DOJ senior leadership made a political decision and refused to allow us to prosecute the executive for felonies. They did allow us to accept misdemeanor guilty pleas. And of course, this removed any incentive for cooperation against responsible Sackler family members. So even though this disposition was not what we wanted or recommended, we thought it would have three important benefits. First, it would brand Purdue the fraud that it was and would raise the awareness of healthcare providers and patients that OxyContin is a dangerous drug and they should be wary of Purdue's marketing claims. Second, even a criminal misdemeanor conviction of the responsible corporate executives would put other pharmaceutical executives on notice that they could be held criminally accountable for decisions that caused their companies to break the law. And third, uh, through the misdemeanor conviction, Friedman, Udell, and Goldenheim would face exclusion from the Medicaid and Medicare programs through a Health and Human Services Office of Inspector General proceedings, which in effect would exclude them from the healthcare industry. So what really happened was Purdue continued their fraudulent business practices for the next 12 years, sold more OxyContin and other opioids than ever, and made billions of dollars for the Sackler family by creating perhaps the greatest health crisis in history. And in fact, in 2020, the company pled guilty to serious fraud and kickback charges. So it became a recidivist criminal. And while we tr at least tried to hold senior executives accountable, there was not even a pretext of trying to do that in the second case, in the 2020 case, and no individual has been prosecuted to date. Second, the Department of Justice has consist consistently over the past 12 years or 15 years done little to hold responsible corporate executives accountable for corporate crimes committed on their watch. And there have been few prosecutions of corporate executives. Third, uh, Health and Human Services Office of Inspector General did in fact exclude Friedman, Udell, and Goldenheim from basically the healthcare industry for a period of 12 years. Slide 18, the last slide, kind of what happened or my reflections in hindsight. Since 2019, when there has been renewed interest in our case, I've spent a good amount of time reflecting on its outcome. I think my current thoughts are best described in in a summary of my statement to the House Oversight Committee in June of 2021 during a hearing regarding passage of the Sackler Act, um, and my statement in February of 2022 to U.S. Attorney Philip Selinger in the District of New Jersey, where, in which I, I was a part of a group requ requesting that his office prosecute individuals for the criminal conduct underlying Purdue's 2020 criminal conviction. And kind of here's what I said in those two meetings. One of the main objectives of the investigation was to hold accountable the highest ranking individuals responsible for criminal conduct. And the investigation obtained enough evidence to support a recommendation that three Purdue executives be prosecuted for serious felony convictions. It was common knowledge, however, that these three lieutenants were directed by the company's owners, the Sackler family. We reasonably believed when faced with felony prosecution, one or more of these three would cooperate to implicate the responsible members of the Sackler family. But the leadership at the Department of Justice made a political decision to usurp the sound findings of the investigation and refuse to allow prosecutions of any individual. So no longer facing felony charges, these underlings could and would take the fall to shield responsible family members from accountability. I've now learned that after the 2007 guilty pleas, the Sackler family didn't even read the pleadings describing the criminal business model. Instead, using a different set of lieutenants, the family doubled down on this business model to increase profits, resulting in the explosion of the opioid crisis and hundreds of thousands of overdose deaths. When they got caught again in 2020, 
the resolution came from the same political playbook, only worse. No one has been charged. The company took the fall and the family was again shielded from accountability. Purdue, under the direction of the Sackler family, is a two-time offender. The Sackler family made billions of dollars from fueling one of the worst public health crises in history. More than a half a million people have died from opioid overdoses, and countless millions of families have been devastated by opioid addiction. The decision not to hold any individual accountable for the serious crimes of a two-time offender company that caused this amount of harm, especially after the political decision in the first case, appears to be the result of yet another politically driven decision, what some have called billionaire justice, but which is actually no justice at all. In fact, it's a perversion of justice. So those are my thoughts that I've given both to the House of Representatives and to the U.S. Attorney's Office in New Jersey, which has the, which is the lead uh, prosecuting office for this uh, 2020 Purdue case. So my final thoughts. The handling of these cases over the past 15 years spotlights a major flaw in our criminal justice system. Billionaires like the Sackler family have the ability to hire attorneys who have influence over political decision makers. And those decision makers readily make political decisions that help the wealthy escape personal accountability for these crimes. Under this system, a poor, young, too often person of color can be imprisoned for 10 years or more for trafficking in a gram or two of an opiate, while a wealthy, politically connected person faces no accountability for making billions of dollars from repeated corporate criminal conduct that fraudulently generates millions of doses of opioids that addicts millions and kills hundreds of thousands. While our justice system is better than most in the world, it needs to be fixed to eliminate the disparity in how it treats the wealthy and the connected. And I'm continuing to ask the Department of Justice to prosecute the individual responsible for Purdue's second criminal conviction. So that's the presentation. Thank you all for your attention. I'm happy to take some questions. I think we've got time. Thank you, Rick. I definitely think we have time. This is uh, Jessica Brown. You can't see me the way we have the camera set up right now, but um, I'm thinking students, you should you should ask your questions and Rick, let me know if you can hear them or not. And if you can't hear, I'll repeat here at the microphone. Okay. Does anyone here in the audience in person have a question? Yes, Drew. <laughs> of course. <clears throat> okay, so. You may not have gotten all the results that you desired, but you definitely made a difference and enacted some change. But it's, you know, one of the reasons it really interests me is because it felt like all the odds were st stacked against you. You know, you said you worked seven days a week for two years. You had a small office, lack of resources, had to manage so many documents, and you didn't give up. And, you know, I want to know. What what makes a person do that? What do you tell yourself? What do you do to keep going? Were you able to hear all that? I was able to. Okay, great. You know, part of it is, I think, comes from my experience. You know, I, I wanted to point out that, hey, my career path didn't necessarily take the the to have the tra trajectory that I that I envisioned it having, but each stop along the way. I learned something, right? Um, you know, doing criminal tax prosecutions, I learned about the importance of documents. Getting kicked out of the colonel's office, uh, you know, as, as a fairly young and new attorney, um, that taught me some, that, that uh, instilled some sort of toughness, some mental toughness, some resolve, some understanding that, hey, if I'm going to, you know, do the right thing, sometimes it's going to be hard and there are going to be some unpleasant consequences as a result. So those kinds, you know, by the time I got to Abbott and by the time I did the Purdue case, I had that 20 years of experience um, 
from all of these different things that I had done, even though they weren't what I necessarily had started out intending to do or wanted to do, each one of those experiences uh, was a building block that enabled me to reach a point where, hey, I, I'm looking at stuff. It's all, you know, I see stuff that's very obvious that there's bad things that have been done. Uh, I know the odds are stacked against me, so the question is, how do I overcome it? So all of those experiences con contributed to having the, the mental fortitude, the determination, and even, yes, the, the ability to put together different pieces. You know, it, mo most, most cases are, that were done by prosecutors were Somebody walks in with a with a report or a case file and says, I've got a case, it's ready to go. Well, all my previous experiences enabled me to kind of figure out how to solve problems. Well, how do I get somebody to uh, uh, help me manage the documents? Um, so I had contacts that I'd made in those other areas. Um, you know, again, looking back, in law school, none of those things were the things I anticipated I would do, but I ended up doing them and they all proved valuable towards being able to solve problems. And at the end of the day, as lawyers, that's really what we contribute, right? We don't make anything, we don't build anything that people can have and hold on to. What you end up being is you're a problem solver. So you wanna learn how to solve problems. You want to uh, do things the right way. And so that's what lawyers do. And so I basically I was just doing what I had been kind of unknowingly been trained to do for the previous 20 years. Great, thank you. We've got another question in the room. Hi, uh, so I guess my question is you've been working within um, sort of the system as it is and uh, what would the steps be like? Obviously, you change things when you, for example, go after the individuals involved rather than just let the company take the fall. But what would the steps be for looking at new ways to change the system and get it moving in a better direction? Yeah, that's a very good question. It's one that I probably don't have the answer to because it's, it's a very <laughs> complicated and complex question um, and probably requires some systemic changes, right? You all are, um, you know, I, I think everybody recognizes that there are flaws in the justice system, that there's unfairness, that there's injustice. And so one of the, so there are two things that I'm looking at now that I'm sort of in the retirement phase. Uh, I think education is important, which is why I um, participate in these kinds of events uh, where I talk to young folks, where I talk to students. Uh, back last February, I, had, I was given the opportunity to speak to a business ethics class uh, at the University of Washington, of course, remotely. Uh, so that, that's one thing is the education. Like you guys, are, you know, basically I'm, I'm handing the reins off I'm handing the baton to you guys. You're the next generation of lawyers. You need to walk into the system. Uh, you're going to be working within the system or uh, up against the system, you know, part of this, the legal system in some form or another. Uh, you need to go in with eyes open with regard to what's wrong with the system and look, be looking for ways to fix it. I don't think that I had that insight when I came out of law school. Um, you know, and maybe, and I was probably somewhat naive even in 19, or even in 2002 when we started that case, thinking that, oh, we're going to go in and, hey, we got, there's a system here where companies basically are just paying fines. You know, maybe they're big fines on paper, like hundreds of millions of dollars. But it's the, for them, it's the cost of doing business because they've made much more than that. And, may, and maybe... We're going, to, we're going to start something new here. We're going to go after individuals, and that's going to be the next trend. Well, it wasn't the next trend, right? So I was kind of naive in that. But it's those kinds of thoughts and ideas that you have where uh, somehow you've got to try to fix this system, and maybe you do it from within or you do it from without. But recognizing, going in with eyes open in terms of education. So that's one way. 
you know, the other thing I, I've, I've started doing is I'm, I'm in contact with uh, groups that have basically their, their victims groups for, um, for individuals, for family members who have lost loved ones to opioid overdoses. And, you know, one of the things they want to see is they want to see some justice done. Um, and the groups that I've been talking to, the individuals that I've been talking to, of folks that have lost loved ones to uh, opioid overdoses, you know, they, they just want justice. And so, uh, to me, prosecuting the individual corporate executives responsible for, you know, cor corporations don't commit crimes by themselves. People are in charge of those corporations and cause them to commit crimes. So prosecuting a corporation is basically worthless. You know, and maybe it gets the headlines, it's nice for a press release, but you're not actually doing anything. You might as well just write, it's like writing out a speeding ticket. Uh, hey, they pay the fine and move on. You're not going to change corporate behavior as long as they can make money off of it. So you've got to go after and hold accountable, personally accountable, the individual executives who are running those companies. So I, that's why I went and talked to the U.S. attorney in New Jersey in February with the, this victims group to ask them to prosecute the individuals that are responsible for the second go around with Purdue. So those are the kind of the two things that I see, but I'm not an expert on that. The, the probably the number of ideas are out there are as, as many as the folks that are on this this call. So I'm passing the baton to you all as well. Does anyone on Teams have a question? Oh, Jonathan. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Um, I guess my question is I, sort of similar to that in the sense, but because of the size and scope of large pharmaceutical companies, did you pursue or do you or see any potential avenues of like antitrust or intellectual patent changes that can be made to that industry to prevent things like this in the future? Yeah, um, two areas that I didn't even take courses in <laughs> on school. <laughs> antitrust, talk about something that's very complex. I don't know that, that you know, an antitrust uh, that's a very complex thing. I don't know that that will provide any kind of uh, change. Patent law, you know, I looked at the patent for Oxycontin and how that was obtained, and there was litigation, lots of litigate, years long litigation about it. All those kind of things are court cases that take years to resolve patent litigation, antitrust litigation, you know. If you're talking about getting legislative changes, well, good luck getting anything, Congress to do anything. That's that's a years long um, proposition. Um, so, you know, based on my limited knowledge of those two uh, areas, I, admittedly, I don't know much about them. Uh, I, I don't see a way to do that with patent and um, antitrust. Uh, and, and in fact, I bet I you would think there would be a lot of pushback because one of the incentives for drug companies to um, ex, you know, conduct trials and to experiment and to conduct studies of new drugs is the patent exclusivity. And if you took away patent exclusivity, uh, they wouldn't put the money into developing new drugs. So I don't know if that would be, you know, I'm not a big fan of taking prescriptions, but I don't know if that would be a, a good idea based on my limited knowledge in that area. Oh, Professor Olnick has a question. Hi there. Um, thank you so much. You're a hero and you're so brave and such a great example of what good lawyering is for our students and lawyers across the country. Um, your timing is brilliant because this week in professional responsibility, we talked about lawyers' obligations in responding to discovery requests. And uh, I had the students do an exercise where they were representing the company that was trying to hide the damaging documents in a drug case that uh, had an impact on, uh, on particular people that took the drug. Um, and how easy it was for the students and all lawyers to fall into how do we hide the documents that are the ones we don't want them to have. Um, and I was seeing all of the 
mil millions, I guess, of documents that you received in that case. Can you talk about uh, any discovery abuses that you faced and um, how you handled them? Were they trying to hide the hide certain documents or did you have to go fight for that? I'm, I'm guessing that you have a story there. So uh, to answer that question, you know, I'm sure they would deny this, but I remember one of the agents that we were working with going through a box of records, one of those bank, long, big long bankers boxes. So I probably had what 5,000 pages in it, whatever those big long, big long bankers boxes have. And he was he was complaining that there was uh, the copy of the same page in it 5,000 times. OK, hey, I'm sure that was just a mistake, right? <laughs> um, and then the fact that they dropped 2,000 boxes on us in and of itself um, was probably an attempt to conceal documents with the thought that, hey, they've only got a few people to look at these and we'll just drown them in these documents. I mean, all of those things I was not surprised by. I was expecting that. Uh, and so, you know, there's two responses to that. When, I mean, look, you should know that that's probably going to happen in these kinds of cases because the company's paying big dollars. I can't remember what, you know, it's, it's probably tens of millions of dollars um, to the lawyers and they expect result, they expect to get something for their money. And the other thing is that it's the company that's putting together the, the, um, these responses, right? These, these responses to our request for documents, because what the lawyers do is they identify, well, who are custodians in the company for certain types of documents. And when we, when the lawyers get those requests for discovery or requests for documents, they go to that custodian, that company employee and say, hey, give us th these records for this item that's in this subpoena or this uh, request for documents. So the company really doesn't even have to, they can put together, if the company is, is adept at and inclined to and experienced at dumping records, they're going to do that even without the lawyer's knowledge. Now, you know, the lawyer's going to know that because presumably they go through and do a responsiveness and privilege review. But, in the, you know, you're going to, we knew what kind of company we were dealing with. We knew what kind of people were in the company. So we expected all that. And so, you know, to me, it was one of those, well, I knew this was going to happen. We're just going to figure out a way to overcome it. Um, and plus, we're the government, okay? And so when the government go, it's a, it's a, there's a big difference between when the government goes to court and complains about, hey, we're getting dumped on by uh, all this discovery and it's being, it appears to be done purposely to prevent us from finding things. There's a huge difference. The courts are less uh, sympathetic to the government than they would be to a private party that comes in and says the government's doing that to us. So I knew two things. We were going to be held to a higher standard. Number one. Number two, this was going to happen. And, and so we just had to figure out a way to deal with it. Um, so, the, you know, the question is, um, is it okay if, you, if you're a, a very interesting ethics question, right? If you're representing the company and you've got, you're turning over uh, 50 boxes of records, and you go through them and you find the one page that's the email that's the incriminating email you have to ethically you have to turn it over but there's is there anything that keeps you from going to box number 25 out of 50 and just sticking it in the middle of the box and saying well if they find good luck finding it uh probably not right other than the ethical rule that says you can't obstruct Right. right. So, and the, and the lawyers are crafting the responses to the discovery requests. And, and so if they know they don't want that document to get to the other side, they can come up with some, you know, uh, boilerplate objection. So, so I, I still feel like if the lawyers are the gatekeepers and they're creating the answers to the discovery requests, they have an ethical obligation to turn over anything that's relevant. So in terms of the criminal terms of the our justice system, if judges were actually um, uh, 
you know, not allowing those sort of boilerplate objections and, and making things be more responsive. And if you're withholding something to actually state that you're withholding it, then we might see a more a freer exchange of relevant documents so that we could get to the actual truth here. Oh, yeah, definitely. But at the same time, though, and, and I did a lot of um, civil work as well, just kind of you know, usual medical malpractice defense and all that for the government. At the same time, most judges don't want to, they don't want to have to deal with discovery issues, right? Um, for they, they're not inclined, you know, they are very reluctant to get involved in those kinds of disputes. And so, um, you know, it becomes sort of a, a cost benefit analysis. How much time do you want to spend fighting over an issue that a judge doesn't necessarily want to be involved in in the first instance? Uh, versus you know, how much is that worth in your time versus figuring out a way around it. So there's some practical things that you have to look at as well. You know, we also, here's another thing we got. We got a, which your question prompted this in terms of, here, here's where the real hiding of documents, I think, comes in. We got multiple, how many pages? Multi-thousands of pages of, a privilege log, okay? We're not giving you these documents because they're privileged. They're attorney privileged. Okay, well, give us a log. All right, well, here comes a stack uh, of, of 2,000 pages of a privilege log, okay? So how do you deal with that? Because now you're talking about how do you go to court and fight over 2,000, you know, what, 100,000 line items of documents that are privileged, right? That's the practical, how do you do that? And you don't know, you can kind of generally have a general description of the document. Uh, so what we ended up doing was I started focusing in on this one particular issue, the congressional testimony, because the, th the three executives had testified before Congress, before congressional committees three times. And they had made statements about when Purdue first learned that their drug OxyContin was being abused on the street. And I believe they lied about it. They said, well, we didn't learn it until 2001 when, uh, you know, the U.S. attorney in Maine brought it to our attention. Well, I believe, I, I think that I saw some documents where they had gotten news reports talking about it being abused as early as 1997. So I think they lied to Congress. So I said, OK, here's here's how I'm going to attack these massive privilege logs where they're withholding stuff they don't want to give us. Uh, I'm going to go to the court and and say, hey, anything on these privilege logs that has to do with their testimony before Congress is part of it is subject to the crime or fraud exception and can't be privileged. And so I'm going to go into the to, to the court. I'm going to go through as much of those logs as I can and find stuff that might relate to congressional testimony. And then I'm going to go to the court and ask the court to make a finding that um, documents that relate to this that that, that there's you know, sufficient evidence of a crime or a fraud having been committed i.e. lying or obstructing Congress, and then ask the court to go through and do a um, uh, in-camera review of some of the, do the documents that we could find that might relate to that. My theory was at least, hey, having a court say, we think you, I think you guys committed a crime, even though that standard is very lo fairly low, was, was some, something good for our case. So. I think the way you have to uh, attack those kinds of issues is to do it, you know, maybe on a, on a piece piece by piece basis. Figure out how do you how do I advance my case, um, and maybe I only can go only dispute a portion of those documents, knowing that the court is not going to be inclined if you're in a massive document case is really not going to, the court is not going to have the resources to go through every document that's not been disclosed or that's been withheld for whatever reason. How do I attack that and make it manageable for the court? I think one of the things that 
I always looked at was, hey, I don't, the only, the only thing I have in terms of the court is my, is, the, is having the court trust me. And so I want to help the court as much as I can because the court has limited resources. The judges might have two couple of clerks, maybe three clerks, and it's a judge, and they're being asked to make decisions on massive cases with massive amounts of evidence. So one of the things that I think was is useful is put yourself in the place of that judge and figure out a way to make it manageable for the judge. So in terms of those kinds of big discovery uh, disputes, try to make them manageable for the judge and make it a little bit more focused. I think that might be another way to approach those, those kinds of issues. Um, Attorney Mountcastle, this is Professor Brown again, and it's five o'clock on a Friday. We want you to enjoy your weekend. <laughs> um, I just want to thank you. This was so informative and educational from just hearing, I think for our students, hearing about how you how you got from the start of your career, you know, from law school to prosecuting this a uh, huge case of such importance in the United States, as well as so informative about what it takes to take on, you know, an undertaking like the case that you prosecuted against Purdue Pharma. And although you say you're retired, it sounds like uh, we should keep an eye out for your name because you're still in the background trying to make things happen. So um, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, it was invaluable to our students. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you all. Thank you. Thanks for everyone coming and everyone on Teams and uh, have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Highlight. Highlight.